going to read a passage to Africa. This is in preparation for your English language exam. It could be selected for you to answer a question, questions four and five on. Please remember that the exam board selects the anthology text for you. You do not get that choice. So make sure that you cover every text that we have covered in class. So the title, A Passage to Africa, is ambiguous. It could mean a journey to Africa or a dedication to Africa. Knowing how the passage ends, I lean more towards the latter, that this is a dedication to Africa. So his intention is um, to kind of serve Africa in some way in his writing. So Alagaya writes about his experiences as a television reporter during the war in Somalia. So we know that this is autobiographical writing, so we should expect um, um, it to, to include anecdotes, um, to be personal and reflective. I saw a thousand hungry, lean, scared and betrayed faces as I crisscrossed Somalia between the end of 1991 and December 1992. But there is one I will never forget. So instantly we are given this image of suffering through a list of adjectives. Um, it's interesting that the final adjective there is betrayed, which may link to the end of the passage where we are encouraged to kind of feel guilty um, with, about our relationship with the developing world. Um, out of the thousand faces, he only cannot forget one. Um, so that intrigues the reader, what was it about this one face? And it's interesting that he doesn't then go on to do, explain that straight away, which obviously encourages you to, um, to read on. But also the fact that he can only remember one out of those thousand also suggests that he didn't care about the other faces, um, which links to um, this apathy that news reporters um, develop from being exposed to these terrible images on a daily basis. I was in a little hamlet just outside Gufgadud, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, so apologies, a village in the back of beyond, a place the aid agencies had yet to reach. In my notebook, I had jotted down instructions on how to get there. Take the Baddeley Road for a few kilometres till the end of the tarmac, turn right onto, the, onto a dirt track, stay on for about 45 minutes, Gufgadud. Go another 15 minutes approx, like a ghost village. So he uses a um, hyperbole, the back of beyond, and this long list of instructions to emphasise the isolation of the village, to really kind of reiterate that this is in the middle of nowhere, not even the aid agencies have reached it. He also uses a simile to evoke sympathy. So um, the fact that it's described like a ghost village suggests that it's soulless, um, which obviously is quite suggests it's quite a depressing place to be. In the ghoulish manner of journalists on the hunt for the most striking pictures, my cameraman and I tramped from one hut to another. The fact that he describes the manner of journalism as ghoulish um, suggests that they almost feed off the dead, and in many ways they do. If you think that they are kind of on the, on the hunt for the, the most striking pictures, many of those striking pictures will be pictures of death. And language choice here, hunt and tramped, um, highlights kind of the predatory nature of his job as a reporter and um, paints the Somali people as vulnerable and, and encourages our sympathy. What might have appalled us when we'd started our trip just a few days before no longer impressed us much. So here he's showing um, how his role encourages apathy. The search for the shocking is like the craving for a drug. You require heavier, more frequent doses the longer you're at it. So again, this simile just emphasises again just kind of how desensitised they, they've come to the horrible images that they see every day but also highlights how kind of greedy this role as a reporter is, that you just always want more. Pictures that stun the editors one day are written off as the same old stuff the next. So the real dismissive tone, especially with that phrase, old stuff, um, which just reflects how the, the media industry 
dehumanizes the subjects of those images. Remember, these the old the same old stuff. We're talking about images of people more than likely um, that are um, experiencing terrible things, and they're just dismissed as old stuff. This sounds callous, but it's just a fact of life. It's how we collect and compile the images that so move people in the comfort of their sitting rooms back home. So he kind of reminds us that we this is for us. This this serves our need for while we sit in the comfort of our sitting rooms. And that just introduces this contrast of our experience in the Western world to those in the developed world. And this will um, be revisited later on in the text. There was Amina Abdur, Abdurrahman who had gone out this that morning in search of wild edible roots, leaving her two young girls lying on the dirt floor of their hut. They had been sick for days and were reaching the final elevating stages of terminal hunger. Notice the language choice there just emphasises this sense of kind of all the energy and life being kind of dragged out of this girl. Her beaver was ten years old and her sister Ion was nine. By the time Amina returned, she had only one daughter. Her beaver had died. Um, it's interesting there, um, if you notice, it's quite a clinical tone. There's no emotion involved um, whatsoever, especially with the use of a simple sentence, her beaver had died. Not even her beaver had sadly died. Um, and if you note what follows, no rage, no whimpering, just a passing away, that simple, frictionless, motionless deliverance from a state of half-life to death itself. So we've got here um, triplets and anaphora which, which serve to, to emphasise how commonplace death is. It's so commonplace that there's no real emotion that takes place when the young girl passes because it's it's just so common. Um, and her state is described as half life to suggest that she that many of them not only her are really all, already dead they're almost like a living it's almost a living death um which just helps emphasize how awful their situation is it was as i said at the time in my dispatch a vision of famine away from the headlines a famine of quiet suffering and lonely death so this is the kind of thing and i haven't made a note of this but this kind of links to this whole idea of old stuff. This it this description sounds awful to me. And to think that if he was to take an image of this and bring it to um, his editors, that they might dismiss this and say, oh, this is old stuff, we've already seen it. And that is quite scary to think um, how desensitised the editors have come. But don't forget that that's for us. And so have we become desensitised as well? Are we greedy? for kind of more shocking images. There was the old woman who lay in a hut, abandoned by her relations who were too weak to carry her on their journey to find food. It was the smell that drew me to the, her doorway, the smell of decaying flesh. Where her shin bone would have been, there was a festering wound the size of my hand. She'd been shot in the leg as the retreating army of the deposed dictator took revenge on whoever it found in its way. The shattered leg had fused into the gentle V-shape of a boomerang. It was rotting. She was rotting. You could see it in her sick yellow eyes and smell it in the putrid air she recycled with every struggling breath she took. So here we've got a great appeal to senses. He's really trying to create this awful, awful image, um, or even just an experience for the reader of um, this suffering that this woman goes through. Quite interesting that um, he uses the word gentle, gentle V-shape of a boomerang to describe her shattered leg. So this is an injury and this gentle, um, the word gentle just offers this contrast um, to the violence that she's obviously um, experienced by this dictator. We have the use of the parallel sentence structure, it was rotting, she was rotting, um, it changes to she. Again, does this link to this idea that um, the victims of this are dehumanised, um, are seen more as objects? And then 
there was the face I will never forget. So we have this one sentence paragraph which just gives great importance to this one face. Which is interesting that he's just given all this detail about this woman who's going through this terrible um, injury. And he doesn't give that much detail at this point. But it's despite how awful she's... All, all the awful imagery of um, this woman and what she's gone through... It's really interesting that the one that he will never forget is still just this face and he hasn't given us any more detail at this point. My reaction to everyone else I met that day was a mixture of pity and revulsion. Yes, revulsion. Um, so he's going to be really honest and frank in this um, paragraph. So he, he repeats repulsion, uh, revulsion um, because he expects the reader to be shocked by the fact that he's used that word. So he reiterates it to kind of be like, yes, I did mean to use that word. So let's see what's, what's so shocking about this. The degeneration of the human body, sucked of its natural vitality by the twin evils of hunger and disease, is a disgusting thing. We never say so in our TV reports. It's a taboo that has yet to be breached. To be in a feeding centre is to hear and smell the excretion of fluids by people who are beyond controlling their bodily functions. To be in a feeding centre is surreptitiously to wipe your hands on the back of your trousers after you've held the clammy palm of a mother who has just cleaned vomit from her child's mouth. There is an element here of him feeling ashamed. He knows that what's happening in these feeding centres is awful and the victims are going through something much worse but he can't help but feel um, revulsion and want to kind of clean himself um, when holding the hand of a mother. Um, the reality is we would probably respond in the same way um, so it gives him credibility that he's being so open and honest about this. There's pity too, because even in this state of utter despair, they aspire to a dignity that is almost impossible to achieve. An old woman will cover her shriveled body with a soiled cloth as your gaze turns towards her, or the old and dying man who keeps his hoe next to the mat with which one day soon they will shroud his corpse, as if he means to go out and till the soil once all, all this is over. So this um, paragraph serves as a contrast to what we've just learned about the feeding centre in the previous paragraph. So despite the horrendous conditions they are in, the suffering that they experience, they still are grasping onto that dignity and I think that encourages the reader to have great respect for them and, and also to, to feel pity for them. I saw that face for only a few seconds, a fleeting meeting of eyes before the face turned away as its owner retreated into the darkness of another hut. So again, re repetition of that face. It's not the face, that face. So it's very specific and it implies that this face is incredibly important to him. In those brief moments, there had been a smile, not from me, but from the face. It was not a smile of greeting, it was not a smile of joy, how could it be? But it was a smile nonetheless. It touched me in a way I could not explain. It moved me in a way that went beyond pity or revulsion. So you'll notice that he, hi, uh, he repeats uh, smile throughout this paragraph and actually into the next one as well. Um, and that just um, reflects his preoccupation with this smile and he, can't, he just can't figure out what was it about this smile that has affected him so much? Also, the disjointed sentence structure. So if you look at the hyphens as well, um, also indicates his altered mindset, as well as the rhetorical question, which isn't just a question for him, it's a question for the reader, and poses, poses a question for them to consider. What was it about that smile? I had to find out. I urged my translator to ask the man why he had smiled. He came back with an answer. It's just that he was embarrassed to be found in this condition, the translator explained. And then it clicked. That's what the smile had been about. It was the feeble smile that goes with apology. The kind of smile you might give if you felt you had done something wrong. So the simple sentence for and then it clicked just... Um, offers clarity or, or shows I should say that this is a moment of clarity or an epiphany if you like um, that he's realised why this smile is so important.
normally inured to stories of suffering, accustomed to the evidence of deprivation, I was unsettled by this one smile in a way I had never been before. There is an, an unwritten code between the journalist and his subjects in these situations. The journalist observes, the subject is observed. The journalist is active, the subject is passive. So he's been really reflective here. It's interesting about this idea of the journalist observes, the subject is observed. It paints the subject, which is the Somali people, as objects, as these passive objects. It dehumanises them. I think it's quite ironic that he says the journalist is active, the subject is passive, because he later reflects and feels guilty about kind of really the the lack of action that he has taken pre, uh, before this. So it's interesting, it's ironic that he says the journalist is active, because we've already learnt that the journalist, if anything, um, is desensitised to what he sees. So in many ways, the the journalist is passive, so it's quite it's a good play on words here. This smile had turned the tables on that tacit agreement. Without uttering a single word, the man had posed a question that cut to the heart of the relationship between me and him, between us and them, between the rich world and the poor world. So we have hyperbole here. He's obviously trying to um, to highlight just how much he's affected by this smile, that it cuts to the heart of, of the relationship between him and, and uh, the, the face, I should say. Um, and what we have also here is between me and him, between us and them, between the rich world and the poor world, he's starting to think about how his relationship with this face, this man who smiled at him, relates to not just that but between the rich and the poor world and he's starting to realize that that smile actually symbolizes um, or reflects much more than just those two if he was embarrassed to be found weakened by hunger and ground down by conflict how should i feel to be standing there so strong and confident and what he's really doing there is not just thinking about that himself he's encouraging the reader to reflect on that as well because he's already mentioned this isn't just about him and the man it's bet it's about the rich world and the poor world so the readers will more likely be um, from the rich world and how do they feel about that I resolved there and then that I would write the story of Guth Good Dude with all the power and purpose I could muster it seemed at the time and still does the only adequate answer a reporter can give to the man's questions so we've got personal pronoun here, so he's really resolute, he's so determined, there's this element of just determination here that he's he's realised from this that he needs to do something, he needs to be much more active. Um, so what he's decided to do um, is write the story of this place. I have one regret about that brief encounter in Guth Gadud. Having searched through my notes and studied the dispatch that the BBC broadcast, I see that I never found out what the man's name was, yet meeting him was a seminal moment in the gradual collection of experiences we call context. Facts and figures are the easy part of journalism. Knowing where they sit in the great scheme of things is much harder. So, my nameless friend, if you are still alive, I owe you one. So we've got this oxymoron nameless friend, so he obviously doesn't have a relationship with this, this man really, but he considers him a friend because he's he taught him a great lesson. Um, so it's quite nice the way he um, he changes his tone into quite an informal tone by saying, I owe you one. You can imagine you'd say that to a friend. Um, what's also interesting to know, I haven't put this down, but um, also the dependent clause here, if you are still alive, um, which is just an extra reminder that um, life is short in this in these places and and death is is commonplace so please remember question four it always focuses on thoughts and feelings this is just an example plan that i advise um that you give some consideration to what would be three or four paragraphs that you could write about the thoughts and feelings of alagaya so i've just given you an example um he certainly sympathises for the Somali people. 
he tries to highlight that news crews become apathetic. Um, and in the end, the main argument really is this idea that we don't deserve the comfortable lives we have. So there's this great, great feeling of, um, of guilt um, for having such comfortable lives and when there are so, so many people suffering in the developing world.